What do I do for fun on a Tuesday afternoon? Actually, it's actually Wednesday, so Wednesday afternoon when I have nothing else going on. Well, I go on Reddit and specifically to r slash fitness or really r slash bodybuilding, natural bodybuilding, r slash Sam Sulek, r, r, just a lot of look less well thought out questions being asked there that i think are just old minds for content creation so i thought hey let's go through them look at the most moronic questions that are out there no offense but they are moronic to be honest and if a little bit of critical thinking was applied to these questions most people could probably solve them for themselves so let's get right into it and just look at the heresy going on within the reddit forums all right, first question on this thread. How difficult is it to gain muscle on a cut versus a bulk? Well, to answer this question, it's almost infinitely impossible unless you've just started some dose of performance enhancing drugs and then it can kind of be easier to leverage building muscle in a deficit because you have a secondary stimulus creating a massive surge of anabolism. But for most people, even who have been on anabolics for some time, so that new stimulus really isn't that novel, won't experience much to any growth in a cut, especially if they're doing a cut correctly. Now, they will experience a precipitous drop-off of anabolism in a cut, but when they enter a bulk, especially after a cut, the anabolism is up tenfold from what it would be when you're at a higher body fat. So while taking a cut could be seeing a, like 10 steps back kind of thing where you've lost weight, you haven't built muscle, et cetera, et cetera. When you get leaner and specifically more insulin sensitive, you're much more able to build tissue at a much faster pace and in a greater amplitude than you would if you were, let's just say a higher body mass, uh, well, fat mass than you would ideally want to be. Next question. Why is it so hard to stay consistent, whether in diet or exercise, especially as a beginner? I've attempted this multiple times. The longest I've lasted was a month. That's crazy. Really, what we're talking about here is you don't want it bad enough. If you have to ask how to get motivated to go to the gym, you don't need to be going to the gym. You don't want it enough. When you're sick and tired of looking and feeling like shit, you'll show up, motherfucker. I'll see you there. Because you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to be like, fuck that. You're going to want to be in the gym. And I've addressed this similar kind of vein of a concept in talking about health before. But generally, people won't change things for their better health unless they have a consequential risk to their health. So let's say you're going about your life and then one day you have a you know cardiac situation like Asmongold who had to go to the emergency room due to having a rat, like an insanely high blood pressure. You go to the emergency room and they tell you, hey man, you are not doing too well. Like your heart is almost in clinical heart failure. You need to work on some things. Usually that is a pretty good motivator to get people to go work out and they will start to stick consistently to their workout regimen. Or in another instance, people who take medication, you were told, hey, you have this sickness, you need to take this medication. That person almost always remembers to take that medication because they know what felt, feeling sick felt like. And so certainly they're going to want to take that medication to make sure that they don't feel sick. It's something that's constantly pestering them. But in our current modern society, being obese or being unhealthy isn't really seen as like a downside or a, a thought of as a, a bad thing in most people's eyes. Now, for me, like if you're obese, real talk, anything you say is kind of irrelevant at a certain point, to be honest, because I, I can just see your work ethic and, and morals within your physical appearance. And that's something that's really detracting from me as a person. And, and so it's it should be this huge incentive to fix yourself because you open up so much more broad uh, scaled things and opportunities for yourself. In, in fact, there's a recent study done and it was obviously like a you can't really you can take these studies with a grain of salt. But on average, people who have a lower body mass index make about 14 percent more dollars per their income uh, for, for the entire span of their life. So let's say you make, you know, $300,000 a year, 14% more is an astronomical amount, especially over the entire lifetime. That's huge. So there's a lot of incentive to get leaner. If you don't stay consistent, you need to do one of two things. Figure out an in like a very specific, uh, very, very intrinsic motivating factor for you. That could be you want to get the girl, you want to get the money, you want to get the six pack, like whatever it is, for whatever reason. Think about the pain of not having that thing, because if you could reveal the pain, you often want to push away from the pain and then reveal the reward and what it would feel like to have that thing, especially on the days where you're not feeling like doing it. That's how you're going to really motivate yourself to the next, next level. The second thing is to ultimately, 
and, and I mean this very real, find ways to stay consistent. So maybe going to the gym five times a week isn't as conducive for you as, as going to the gym three times per week. But I would argue that going to the gym three times per week is still far better than going to the gym five times per week compared to zero <laughs> times a week, right? So if going to the gym five times a week pushes you away from not going to the gym at all, five times a week isn't for you, bro. Do three times a week and that's just fine. Dorian Yates, one of the best bodybuilders in the world, trained three times per week. So you can get shit done at a less frequent state and not having to try as hard as a bodybuilder, for instance. And I think a lot of people conflate that they have to try extremely hard to get the results. Really getting lean and muscular is a fucking easy process. It just matters how consistent you can stay. So the problem is finding out how you need to do things differently from everybody else to stay consistent. Maybe that means you have to find ways to eat healthy that aren't meal prepping because you don't have time. Maybe you have to order a meal prep service. Maybe you have to find places that you can go out to eat, which would align with your specific goals. These things are easy solutions, but critical thinking again here lapses with most people. Next question. I'm a 32 year old male and have been lifting weights inconsistently for a couple of years. Now I've been training regularly for a couple of weeks, but I always get dizzy and nauseous after doing barbell squats. How do I prevent this? Well, for one, breathing. This is something that most beginners don't comprehend. You need to inhale and exhale and then create intra-abdominal pressure on the way down. So you do this by inhaling on the way up and then exhaling and then crunching down in your abs on the way down. Or some people like to do it in reverse. It's really up to you. There's no perfect method as long as you're functionally breathing. I prefer to do it the opposite way because you do it, you know, breathing in when you come up, which is, is uh, or out when you come up, which is what some people do. And you apply that intra-abdominal pressure. You can create a lot of abdominal distension. Well, I'm getting into the weeds here. Do it whatever you want. Make sure you're breathing in and out on each rep. That's the best way to think about it. The second thing is make sure you're hydrated. I see so many fucking idiots walking around the gym without any sort of water bottle or water source at all. Not drinking water. Ask anybody, how how much water do you drink a day? Uh, I don't know, a couple glasses. What the fuck are you doing? Drink more water. We are creatures that are made majoritively of water and we need more water. You, you can't oxygenate your blood if there isn't enough blood volume to oxygenate. So that is water, right? The the, the blood, the albumin, the, the, the shit we need in our blood, the, the veins you see, all water, right? So the stuff that's flowing through it is being transported by that, that serum or that water. And so not having enough water is really going to slow down nutrient slash oxygen delivery to your brain and other tissues, which will make you dizzy. Breathe, drink water, and of course, train with appropriate weights. Next question. Why are popular splits focused on demolishing a muscle at a time? Like for example, in PPL, you do incline press and maybe a pec deck and a tricep overhead and push down. Instead, why don't you split up the volume and exercises same, but reorder the split so you do incline one day, pec deck the next day, and then some leg exercises with it. The recovery between the different exercises will be much better better, no? Basically a full body split, but with a variable, some variation from day to day. I would actually argue that that's a great point, and most people could leverage this. And I've talked about this in my Discord quite a bit in our training channel, but what I have been doing lately is just switched to an upper lower split. So one day I'm training all upper body, biceps, that light just went off, biceps, triceps, chest, back, shoulders, etc. But I'm only doing like a small amount of volume. So it doesn't take me all day to get those things done. Then on other days, I'll train lower where I'm training quads, hamstrings, calves, etc. Adductors, abductors, and that will rotate throughout a week. So I'll do upper, lower, upper, lower, upper arms pretty easy split. Then my goal with that is to every upper day, I'm trying to say muscles, but at a lower volume, but a higher frequency. And so the stimuli per week for me is much greater than someone only training one muscle once per week. This might sound counterintuitive to a lot of people because you're only doing a few sets per muscle per day. But when you spread it out across the week, you're actually doing more sets than you would be doing on a single day, for example, like a chest day. I've actually found this to be a very beneficial way to get people to grow quite rapidly because at the end of the year, they've stimulated that muscle to grow several hundred times, whereas someone training once per week has only done so a couple tens of dozens of times, not hundreds of times, right? Been working with a trainer for a month now and I feel great, but I feel like I would do even better being able to stick to my macros. How do you guys combat the temptation to not eat your meal prep? Well, it's going to suck and this answer is not for everybody, but get used to eating shit. That is bland because the food that's out there in society right now is so hyper fixated on being savory or sweet to the maximum, unloading dopamine on your brain, making you think that 
that is good food and anything else is bad food. But that's actually not true. That is the codex that the system we live in has given you. What's the actuality of the situation is a steak tastes fucking amazing. And you can really enjoy a steak if you don't eat pre-processed, packaged, or fast food shit all the time. Because when your taste buds are understimulated, and trust me, from being in the military, you know, living in the desert for a month at a time without any actual hot food, like living out of bagged food, like we call them MREs, meal ready to eats. When you taste food that has been made, for example, a steak, you almost want to cry. It tastes so good. But the problem is, is we inundate ourselves with these hyper palatable foods all day long. And so now suddenly your meal preps taste less than, even though they're truly more than. And if you give this meal prep to someone from a different country who's less advantageous, they would love it. It is literally just a frame of mind that you have failed to get yourself out of, to reach the escape velocity from. And in my personal belief, you need to just recalibrate. You need to avoid foods that do create a lot of temptation and desire by just abstinence. And it sucks. It's hard to do. It's not fun. But that's part of the fucking game. You have to learn how to recalibrate your body to be something that it is not now. As the saying goes, nothing changes if nothing changes. You can't just expect to eat meal preps and then suddenly be consistent. You're going to have to consider that there is going to be challenges along the lines when you eat meal preps. Unfortunately, we are not robots. We are chemical based creatures that excrete chemicals in response to certain stimuli. Realistically, you've been abusing those stimuli for your entire life. You kind of fucked the pooch. Next question. I'm one week into my cut and honestly not feeling too bad. I'm actually worried that I'm doing something wrong. I feel like I'm counting my calories just fine using my fitness pal and where possibly I am intentionally underestimating the calorie burn too. Is it normal to not feel bad during a cut? I am one week in and I'm only getting minor hunger pangs, but it's nothing I can't ignore. One week in. <laughs> Look, cuts for a bodybuilding prep, uh, they don't get bad until three, six, seven weeks out uh, for me. This is where I differentiate from a lot of people. Some people get really, really bad, like food focus and crabbiness, like really close uh, to the start of their prep. But for, for me and a lot of other people I know, it usually takes until you're already pretty damn close to single digit body fat percentages to get really bad hunger. Now, if you're experiencing this prior to getting to a lean state or what most people would consider a lean state, or if you're getting this super early on into a diet, it either means one of two things. One, the preparatory work before the diet was not satisfactory. I mean, you weren't eating enough, you weren't metabolically regulating your body, and therefore you didn't suddenly just, uh, you, you didn't give yourself enough room to pull calories down essentially, which is a horrible situation to be in. Two, the other problem is you probably just drastically cut calories way too much and started doing far too much cardio at the very start of your prep, which led to massive degrees of hunger pains and issues and crabbiness and tiredness and all these other bullshit things. If most people took their time, calculated their thoughts and, and what they're doing again, critically thinking about their cut, there wouldn't be these problems where they would have this exorbitant amount of hunger and tiredness. For instance, this guy probably did the right thing where he's over calculating his calorie intake and underestimating his calorie burn. He's probably not doing too much and he feels fine. That's great. It's one week. So maybe next week you'll feel like garbage. But generally speaking, if you're doing things right, cutting shouldn't be any different than bulking. It's just a little bit different in food intake and a little bit different in activity. And to be honest, you should feel better when you're cutting, especially initially than when you're bulking nine times out of 10. So that's the, the two cents there. Next question. And the last one for this video, I waited four days to ask my extremely moronic question. I wanted to take my picture of my back while I'm flexing to see my back development progress and see which back muscles might need more focus. I do not have a partner. I'm too shy to ask my friends. I do have two mirrors, which I can face each other to let me see my back directly. Any ideas to do this? Okay. It's called a front facing camera. You stand in front of a mirror, turn around, take your camera out, use the front facing camera, take a picture. Done deal. Now, if you want to see yourself flexing, you just simply get a tripod with a button or a Bluetooth button and then click that button when you want the picture taken. Bada bing, bada boom. You got yourself a good picture of your back. Very, very simple. What I typically do because I'm a moron and I don't have tripod or a button with me at any point in time is I'll go stick my phone like this with uh, itself sticking out right here. I'll grab a coffee, a, uh, a coffee cup. I'll put my phone and lean it up on next to it just like this on the table. And then I will set a timer for the camera. It'll be 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. By that time, I'm facing the camera with my back flexing, ready to go. It snaps a quick picture. I come back and look at it. It probably looks like garbage. So I have to do it two or three times, but then I get it good. That's generally how I do it. And I recommend most people do it. If you don't have a tripod set up, it works extremely well. And there's almost nothing wrong with doing it that way. Let me know if you enjoyed this kind of video. 
world. Happy to do them again. There's tons, like, I mean tons. We could go to steroid conversations. We could go into bodybuilding conversations. Tons of questions and threads like this that we could just destroy. I love doing it. If you guys have more interest in this, let me know down in the comments below. Also, it would be super helpful if you did subscribe to this channel and hit the bell the notification button. It helps me get pushed into the algorithm and a lot of my views get more views than most channels with a ton more subscribers. So I feel like all I need to get is the people who are watching my content to subscribe and that would be awesome. Thank you guys. I'll catch you in the next video.